jump right into today's scripture text. There is an edit. Um, I think on the bulletin it's posted as Ephesians chapter 4 verses uh, 11 through 16. But instead we're going to be doing um, verses 14 through 17. So if you can make that adjustment. And we will recite this in response to the reading. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. <clears throat> Since there is speaking of the truth in the law, we will be invited to become in every respect the mature body of the him who is the from him the whole body, joined and held <coughs> together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, and as each part does its work. I'm sorry, that was the last word. That was the last verse. Um, Pastor Paul, if you can come up, he's going to be delivering our um, sermon today entitled um, Unity it Does Body Good. Good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, be thou exalted. Wow. I had never heard that before. What a profound song. Mm -hmm. I like that. Do any of you remember, probably not many, the 1980s, there was a campaign put out by the dairy industries trying to promote the drinking of milk. Mm -hmm. And they had these commercials that ran, and Sebastian sent one to me this week, and it said, milk, it does a body good. Milk. Well, we're going to talk about the spiritual body this morning, and unity, how it does a body good. But what I want to do, um, I want to kind of bring you up to speed. Why do we preach? Why do we talk the way that we do little bit by little bit through a chapter. And I need to I need to tell you where the Lord took me prior to coming to the open church. And I, I mentioned last week some of the things that I prayed about. But the Lord gave me some specific things. And one of them was, I wrote them down here. The first thing was unity. Talk and try to uh, discuss unity. So that was one of the things. The second thing that the Lord laid on my heart was be consistent with your teaching. Be consistent um, week in, week out. Be consistent. And I don't know if you've ever done this before, but have you ever attended a church uh, where one week you may be in 1 John, the next week you may be in Judges, the next week you may be in Revelation, the next week you may be in John chapter 3, and you're just all over the place. And I felt like the Lord laid on my heart to be true to the text whenever I come to the open church be true to the text and teach people how to navigate their Bibles. Because, I don't know, I, I mentioned to you before that I came from the uh, building industry. And I've been to thousands, if not tens of thousands of building sites. And never once have I seen sheetrock go up before a foundation has been poured. There are things that we have to do first in our faith to get level to get sure footing that has to be built off of that. And if you do not, you, you, you can't put the pretties and the excesses and the fluff and all of the other thing until we know what the skeleton system, until we know what the bones and the structure is of the body. So what I felt like the Lord told me to do whenever I come to the open church, lay a foundation. And there's going to be other people that are going to build off of that foundation. Scripture talks about how Paul laid a foundation. Other people came in and they added and other people they, they watered. That's going to happen in this, this journey. But I felt like the Lord told me that we needed to, this is why I do what's called expository preaching. We work our way through. And by doing so, we can lay one layer on top of the other and build a more sure footing. So if you ever wonder, why does Pastor Paul just keep harping on Ephesians or something like that. It's because I felt like that's what the Lord told me to do. Amen. So last week we started back into Ephesians. 
And, um, you know, the Apostle Paul, we, we looked at what he talked about, the, the uh, variety, the, the uh, oh, what's the word that I'm looking for? The, the diversity, that's the word, that the diversity in administration and leadership of the church. That was one thing that we talked about. We also talked about how diversity is a gift that the Lord gave to the church. We're not all the same flavors. We're not all the same colors. He gives diversity and he sanctions and he approves that diversity. And then we talked about how without unity, we're actually powerless to do what he told us to do in carrying out the Great Commission. Without unity, we are actually a negative witness to the world. And without unity, if we don't keep unity, we're actually posturing ourselves into a position that is in opposition to what he said in John chapter 17, where the Lord prayed specifically, may they be one as you and I are one. And then uh, I, I, I got away from my notes last week and I started talking about whenever I was a boy growing up on the farm and how whenever we baled hay and how that band that held the hay bale together is like the bond of peace, what the Holy Spirit does. Sorry, I got out of my notes last week. I didn't stay true to the road, but um, that's kind of what we what we ended up on. So this week, we, did, we didn't get far in our, our, our message last week, but we come to this point in scripture here where in verse 14, the Apostle Paul says this great big four-letter word, then. He says, then. In other words, that's one of these hinge words that I've talked about a couple times where what is being said hinges right there because until we get this part right, we can't do then. It's, it sounds like what the Apostle Paul is saying that he indicates that everything that he just talked about from verse 11 through 13, until that's done, we can't do that starting in verse 14. So if those things don't happen first, this next stuff is not going to happen. But what the Apostle Paul is actually saying, I need to be able to move a little bit. Took seven little boys hiking yesterday, and I'm convinced that all seven of them are part boy and part mountain goat, but we went hiking through Oak Mountain, and I'm just a little bit sore and need to be able to move around this morning. But what the Apostle Paul is actually saying to these believers is he says, you are still a bunch of toddlers. You're still learning. You're, you're still um, infants in the faith. Now, I know Soyeon works with kids and Anna works with kids. What do we know about children? Little kids. I remember a few years ago. It's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite pictures that we have at our house. That uh, we came into the kitchen very early in the morning. Little Wyatt was maybe a year and a half old. We walked into the kitchen and we find Wyatt sitting square in the middle of the floor of the kitchen, and he has a one-gallon bucket of ice cream, and that's what he's having for breakfast at six a.m. Little guys. Children, infants, they, we, we know that they don't always make the best decisions. We know that children believe and trust anyone and everyone that talks to them normally. Children often make bad decisions. They, they oftentimes don't know that that spider is harmful, or that bee will sting you, or that wasp doesn't like you, even though it looks really cool. They, they, they don't know what is harmful and what's good for them. And oftentimes, children don't have a firm <coughs> grasp on reality. They think they can fly. They think that they can do other things. So the Apostle Paul looks at this first century church and he says, you know, you're just like a bunch of infants. You're dependent 
on your parents. You're dependent on others. And I don't want you to think that the Apostle Paul is being ugly to this body of believers because he, he's not being mean-spirited. Th this wasn't the first time that the Apostle Paul had addressed these people. If you go way back into November when we started this, the Apostle Paul actually lived with these people for three years. He had invested time. He had invested uh, relationship. He knew that, that there was a backstory and he understood that the Ephesian church was plagued with um, aberrant teaching. It was plagued with its share of heresies and, and bad doctrine. You know, sometimes you know somebody very closely and because you have that relationship with them, you can speak to them just a little bit more frankly than you could with someone that you don't have that relationship with. And we're on 2,000 years later reading this relationship, but I want you to understand that the Apostle Paul had a relationship with the Ephesian church here. Is there anybody in your life that you can think of right now that other people, if they heard you talk to that person, they would think that you were being ugly, that you're being frank, I can think of one very specific example, but I won't say it because those people might be watching. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes <clears throat> because we have relationship and we're close to people, we can speak to them more direct than what someone else that has no relationship with them. I want you to look at Acts chapter 20, what the Apostle Paul actually says to the Ephesian believers whenever he is uh, making his last um, farewell speech to them. In Acts chapter 20, verse 25, the Apostle Paul says, Now I know that none of you among, now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep, this is, this is if, if, you're, if you're an underliner, underline this. He says in verse 28, he says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Verse 29 says, I know that after I leave, Savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number of men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. And then he says, remember that for three years I have never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. That speaks to a significant investment of time and relationship that the Apostle Paul has invested into this body of believers. And it's a hard place to be in whenever, um, you know, you've got this kind of, you, you know that you're leaving and you hope that what you have done, it's, it's like raising a child. You hope that you raise them right and in a way that whenever they're on their own, they make the right decisions. And it's one reason why I have encouraged every church that we have been at and been involved in ministry to pray for discernment because discernment is the protector of the church. And the Apostle Paul says right there that you're going to have some bad things coming. My first point this morning is that we must have childlike faith, but we've got to have a full-grown discernment. You see, there is great focus in verses 11 through 13 where the Apostle Paul speaks about what communal maturity looks like. But now he's going to bring up what communal immaturity looks like. Communal maturity comes with it, it brings some very, very good qualities to the table. The unity of the faith is one of them. The knowledge of the Son of God. 
mature manhood and the fullness of Christ. That is what communal maturity looks like. But communal immaturity brings some baggage to the table as well. And communal immaturity brings disunity. It brings instability. It brings scheming and trickery. And the Apostle Paul says, um, I don't want you to be I don't, I don't want you to be like children that are tossed to and fro by the waves of doctrine, by every wind of doctrine that comes along. And boy, I tell you what, you can just turn on your Christian television and see some winds of doctrine flying around out there. This, I, I want to say something about being tossed to and fro. The Greek word there, I'm not going to give it to you, but the Greek word there is the same Greek words that are used in Luke chapter 8 in verse 24 whenever it describes the stormy sea of Galilee, the raging water being tossed to and fro is like being on raging waters. And, and you know, I've got to say this, that there's, there are times in our lives that we see people that are well-meaning, well-intentioned Christians who um, improperly place a higher value on movement upon activity than they do growth. And in conjunction with what the Apostle Paul is talking about here, he says, I don't want you to be blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Have you ever seen people that they're looking for a new revelation? They're looking for a new way that something can be described. Good biblical exegesis will tell you that a, um, uh, how do I want to, that a unique interpretation is usually wrong. So don't go chasing after those unique interpretations. Stay consistent and true to what God has shown the last 2,000 years of biblical scholarship. But we see these people that play, place this high value on movements, high value on, 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 on uh, working and, and just doing things, but <clears throat> they, they see all that activity as a positive thing. My point number two is that do not value movement over growth. Mere movement is like being tossed to and fro. But that's not where God wants us to be. He wants us to grow up. Grow up into the, the, the head, which is Christ. You know, that movement is sometimes fun when we explore, and we discover things, but it's also a time where we can be shipwrecked. It's also a time where we can be taken advantage of. It's a time where we can be schemed, we can be deceived. It's a, it's a time that people will take advantage of you. So don't value movement over growth. And then he comes along and he begins to speak in verse 15 here about the truth in love. And you know what? I just read to you in Acts chapter 20 how the Apostle Paul talks to the Ephesian elders. That is an example of truth and love. <clears throat> Whenever he says, you're like an infant, that's truth and love. Sometimes we don't have the rights to be able to say things to people because we've not invested into them. And the old cliche is true that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Sometimes that truly applies. But we read it here at face value. And we think that the Apostle Paul is being harsh by saying you're like children when he bids them farewell. But keep in mind that for three years with tears, some of your other translations say, I was in your homes night and day with tears. So whenever you and I read this, we see a person that's possibly harsh. But whenever they read this letter, they saw the passion and the sincerity behind it. They saw his pride in their lives. Some people 
do very, very well at speaking the truth, but they are void of love. Some people do very, very good at loving people, but they're void of the truth. But the mature Christian should encompass both in their life. A mature Christian is able to do both. And I don't understand how people can read this scripture and they think that it is a license to be ugly and harsh and stifling to people. Well, they've got to know the truth. Well, they've also got to know the love. We're image bearers of the one that loved people more than anyone loved people. And all of us from the South have probably heard this expression before, bless their heart. <laughs> I've been on the receiving end of some of those bless your hearts. And it's not really a blessing at all. It's, it, it's funny because we probably all heard it, probably all been guilty of saying it. But what we're actually saying is, oh, you poor thing, you're so idiotically wrong that you don't even realize it. But I'll be glad to set you straight. It's really not a blessing. And Paul isn't telling us to pre-qualify truth and love with some sort of um, um, patronizing effect before we just really lay into a person. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that uh, speaking the truth in love isn't just some sort of pithy saying that he, uh, an apostle penned. It's, it's showing time and investment and love and that you care for them. And then that you, you, you've got history with these people. And the Lord says in verse 15, he speaks, and it, it, I think it's amazing that the church's growth into Christ is actually God's gift and it's a promise. It's a gift and it's a promise. We have not grown up yet. We have not arrived there yet. It's, it's progressive. It's progressive. It hasn't happened, but it's happening. We continue to grow when we come together when we pray together, when we spend time together, whenever we eat together, these times around here on Sunday, whenever the chairs are pushed back and we've got tables and we're, 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 we think that we're eating, what was that stuff that you told me last week that we ate? Mook? We think we're eating mook, but we are digging roots. We're, we're establishing, we're, we're building up faith. We're encouraging. We're admonishing one another during that time. It's amazing the life that is actually happening there. Yes. And Sebastian and I can sit down and talk for eight hours about nothing but barbecue. But that's something is happening in our life with one another, in our community, with each other. Martin Luther once wrote, he says, this life therefore is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. It's not health, but it's getting well. It's not being, but becoming. It's not rest, but exercise. We are not now what we shall be, but we are on the way. The process is not yet finished, but it is actively going on. This is not the goal, but it is the right road. At present, everything does not gleam and sparkle, but everything is being cleansed. Yeah. There is a work going on in our hearts when we encounter one another. My third point this morning, and I need to move quick. The evidence of the mature body is as each part does its work. When each leader is on board, when each teacher is on board, when each... Uh, person in the chairs, in the pews, is on board. When every single point, that knuckle, that joint, that hair, that ear, that uh, tooth, tongue, eye, bones, whenever we all come together, even the brain cells, <clears throat> when we all come together, we supply a coordinated effort to walk into the world as a uh, 
person that uh, shows the world what Jesus looks like. That is when we know that we are seeing maturity among us. You know, I mentioned it last week that you wouldn't want your body to grow out of proportion. Whenever we all grow in proportion, <clears throat> that's healthy. Whenever we all grow in the same spirit, that's healthy. Miss Onda, if you can come help me. <clears throat> you know, some people think of the church as a pyramid. Think of the church as a pyramid. And they think that the pastor is at the top, and it's not. We're a body. We're a body. And then others think of the church like it's a bus being driven by the pastor and all of you are willing people that know where your seat is on the bus and all of you are passive passengers. It's not. It's a body. You know, God wants us to see the church as a body where every part has a job. Every part shares as it matures. And as we share and we mature, we can do more complex things. Like I said last week, even reaching down and picking up a box, there are thousands and thousands, th probably millions of parts of your body doing work at the same time for a coordinated effort. There is nothing more beautiful that I can think of in life than watching one of a child, one of our children grow and mature into a productive um, adult. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about this. You know, I'm a father of four, and if you want me to, I will take up the whole afternoon talking about my children and showing pictures about them. <clears throat> I'm proud of them. Every one of them, I'm proud of them. If you're watching, kids, I'm proud of you. <laughs> you know, years past, fathers would carry a wallet that was about that thick, and whenever someone would say something about their kids, they'd pull out and say, let me show you some pictures, and the, the thing would fall down and say, this is, you know. <laughs> but now we've got these devices that we walk around with, and. And uh, I can't show you 25 pictures, but I can show you 25,000 pictures on my phone. And I, I just kind of think that equally, there's a bit of pride and satisfaction whenever our Heavenly Father sees His children grown and mature and working together to show the expression of Jesus to the world. I think maybe he's a proud father. So, as we come to the end here, I guess my questions for you this morning are, do you know your part? Do you know your body part? Do you know where you fit in the body of Christ? I so want you to be involved. I so want you to be working with the other parts of the body. And I know that some people feel like they're having to overcompensate for other parts. We're going to pray about that too. So can you stand with me?